Hello, I'm Jamie McDonald and welcome to another installment of Investor Masterclass. In this episode, Raoul sits down with Michael Vrenos, the CEO of Ellington Management Group. For over 20 years, Ellington has delivered exceptional risk-adjusted returns, partially because of their deep expertise in credit and mortgage-related markets, but also because of the way Vrenos has run his firm, which is always with a mind towards anti-fragility. He's very thoughtful about the business of running a hedge fund, and that comes across very clearly in this interview. As you'll see, many of his insights are for the more sophisticated investor, but still, it's an incredible treat for anyone who wants to take a peek behind the curtain of how an investor at the highest level thinks about leverage, liquidity, risk management, and building a firm that has outlasted LTCM, the GFC, and now COVID-19. Let's take a look. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you on Real Vision. It's really good to see you. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate it. Um, you know, there's a lot to dig into. You know, you've had an incredible career. Uh, built, you know, a very famous and uh, gr great hedge fund business over the years. But I really want to go back to find out, you know, where did Mike come from originally and how did he get here? So I know there's a hell of a story here. You know, <laughs> one point you were referred to as the most powerful man on Wall Street. You're one of the big bond traders. There's a big story to unpack. So let's go back in time and tell us how the hell you got into this crazy business to start with. Well, it was sort of serendipitous. I mean, I was... Um... I was studying, you know, math at Harvard. I was a math concentrator, and I um, had. But you, but even that was interesting because you were a small town boy in the middle of oh, nowhere, yeah. Connecticut, well, if you right? Want to go way back, yeah. Well, yeah, let's do that. Let's do it. Well, okay. So, um, you know, my family—they're uh, immigrants from from Greece. My grandparents on both sides came from Greece uh, and settled in Worcester and Boston, Massachusetts, and my. Parents actually knew each other a bit growing up, and uh, and um, my father was a, was a scientist, and he he got a PhD in chemical engineering, and I was born in Worcester where he grew up, and after a few years there, he moved to uh, this very small town called Ellington, Connecticut. You know, hence the eponymously named Ellington, um, and. Uh, and you know, it was just a very rural area. It still sort of is. Um, in fact, our street originally was called Rural Route One or Two. I think it was dirt <laughs> for a while, and then it became Hayes Avenue. And it was about twenty minutes from East Hartford, where the um, United Technologies Research Labs were, where he was the scientist. So, so I grew up there. Uh, and again, it was a small farm town, and to some degree, still is. And I went to the local schools there. Uh, you know. Um, a lot of the locals, not not everyone went to college or anything like that. It was just a very quaint, um, somewhat isolated or insulated place. Um, and I got a bug for math a little bit, you know, and I ended up studying it more on my own when I got to high school, sort of like a self-directed thing. And, um, you know, was fortunate enough to get accepted at Harvard where, you know, that was a very uncommon thing, you know, where I'm from to say the least. And- um, Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. You know, was fortunate enough to get accepted at Harvard, where, you know, that was a very uncommon thing, you know, where I'm from, to say the least. And, um, and you know, I was 
very unsophisticated at the time. And a lot of Harvard students were, you know, they, they, it's a very diverse set of kids. And so I didn't know what a subway was or what, you know, starch in the collar was or anything like that. Uh, but I proceeded through and I made a lot of great friends and I studied some very interesting things there. I've got, again, you know, studied math and I took a lot of science classes like physics and chemistry, by all, all that stuff. I thought maybe I'd want to be a doctor. And then I wrote an undergraduate thesis and uh, was accepted to a couple graduate school programs for math. And one was at Stanford and um, toward the end of, uh, or actually the middle of spring of my senior year, I'd say it was March or April, actually. Um, my thesis advisor had asked me how much I enjoyed writing the thesis versus classwork. And I said, well, not quite as much because it was a very lonely endeavor. And I really liked the classwork and I liked the people. And I goes, well, geez, you know, you should really think about doing this PhD. You're going to be, you know, kind of sequestered away and all this a different life. And, and this just, just struck me like a lightning bolt. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Of course, now, like I said, it's mid mid spring of my senior year. And I, I lived in a dorm with a lot of, you know, sort of sophisticated people. And, you know, a lot of kids were going into these banking programs. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to go apply for a banking job. I didn't know what one was, but it was this guy at the gym that I used to train with at the business school said, you know, you should apply for jobs at Kidder Peabody because, you know, I worked there one summer and the lunches were good and all this. So, <laughs> The lunches were good, yeah. And as it, as it was, all the Goldman, you know, um, spots were taken already and all that, but there was a sign-up sheet for Kidder Peabody. So I signed up for a couple interviews there. One was in project and lease finance, and another was in trading. And they were um, good enough to offer, each of them offered me a job. So um, the, the project and lease finance job was $24,000 a year, but it was at least 50 hours a week. And you had to do some programming and things like that, which I was not very good at. And then the trading job, apparently, you know, you could be out by five or five thirty, so you know I could go to the gym, right? So, but it was twenty two thousand. So I said, okay, I'm going to take the trading job. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so a lot of thought went into this, obviously. <laughs> anyway, so I, um, they immediately moved me out to Chicago because that which, was, which year was this? I'm just trying to frame this in where the bond markets were. Yeah, 1983. Okay. So, so, so just to remind everyone, okay, so this is sort of like still toward the mid to late stages of these incredibly high interest rates um, that came off from the late 70s. So, you know, the mortgage rate was 15% and it was dropping to 13 over the course of the first 1983, I believe. Um, you know, and I, I believe the curve was flat or inverted, like short rates were very high as well, mid teens, almost 20 um, and, and that was the state of affairs of the fixed income market. And, um, at the time there was this canonical trade where you do a cash and carry bonds to futures and other kinds of, you know, cash to futures trades that kid or Peabody was quite good at. So what they did was they, as a, as a training program, moved me to Chicago and I was in the pits, just basically yelling in orders or helping out to yell in orders. They didn't actually give me enough responsibility. <laughs> to do the actual orders, but, you know, to pass them along or whatever. And then I came back toward the end of the year and started in research in mortgages. And, uh, you know, as it were at the time, it was the 80s and things were kind of loosey-goosey and the portfolio manager or the, or the traders didn't always show up to work. And, you know, they <laughs> there was some, yeah, there were a lot of things going on. So one day my boss just said, okay, now you're the, you're the trader. So, okay. It was me and this other fellow, my partner, who's still with me today at Ellington, Mike Zaretsky. And we started to split up this big list of mortgage securities that we needed to trade. Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny. And the this is the same time that Merriweather and the gang are at Salomon. It's that they're, period they're, of them. They're probably there, if not even a little bit after. I don't know when they started. No, right, yeah. Um, so, but you're right. That group that was long-term capital previous to that were a big prop shop. Because they're going to come back into the story later. They come back into the story, yes. So, um, so okay, so we're going way back. So, but anyway, so um, so here we were trading these pass-through securities and, you know, the, the same ones that exist today, you know, in the same form. Um, and then the, the market 
started to turn to structured credit. And we're going to talk a lot about structured credit today. And I can give a loose definition. Everyone has their own definition of it. I think at one point it was a euphemism for mortgages when no one wanted to say that because people are always worried about mortgages blowing up. But it's anything structured that has a credit risk, right? So at the time, you had these Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny bonds that were issued, you know, they were pooled mortgages issued by these government agencies, uh, quasi-government agencies, and they were pass-throughs in the sense that the principal and interest kind of just passed through to the investor. But as the 80s rolled on, it became clear that some innovation was helpful or even necessary to the market because, you know, some players like a bank might want a short tranche and an insurance company might want a long tranche. Other um, players might want something that's protected so they have less prepayment risk and all that. So the CMO market started to grow and we made a transition at Ketter Peabody from not just only trading pass-throughs, but becoming pretty big CMO originators. And around the last few years that I were there, we were by far the large, largest CMO originator, you know, hundreds of billions of these CMOs. And, um, and from these CMOs came mortgage-backed derivatives too. So these were highly levered, in, internally levered securities where, you know, maybe you'd have a lot of prepayment risk coupled with a lot of like coupon risk where, you know, an inverse floater, for example, the coupon might vary inversely with four or five or six times the LIBOR rate. So if LIBOR goes up 100, your coupon would go down 600 and things like that. So um, so that was, there was, it was a big setup for this, obviously, because what happened is, and I believe in one of the interviews you had with Jeff Gunlock, he explained that, you know, and I think some people remember that in the, uh, in the early part of 94, there was this precipitous rise in rates and it occurred sort of ratcheted over the course of three or four months, maybe the Fed oh, yeah. blew everybody up at the time. Yeah. So the, the impact on these mortgage backed derivatives was tremendously, it was tremendous. So um, anyway, so what happened was some of these securities lost 30, 40, 50, 60% of value over the course of um, just a few months. And they weren't just held by hedge funds. There were very few hedge funds back then. They were held by long only managers. So it was, it was quite surprising for maybe someone who, uh, an, a retail investor on the mutual fund, all this stuff like that. So um, it, was, it, was a, it was a disaster in some ways. Wall Street had extended a lot of credit to David Askin, which was, he was one of the notable uh, mortgage hedge fund managers at the time. Like I said before, there weren't many. And he wasn't able to meet margin calls and there was this big buy-in. And then as a result of that, I, it was probably March or April, I think, um, these securities just kind of traded around very weakly over the ensuing six months or more, actually more, to the point where you know you could get practically guaranteed unlevered low to mid teen returns. And had you had your book blown up in this process because Goldman blew up and a lot of people did because ninety four was a hard year for a it lot. Was a of hard people, right? year. No, it, you know it. You know, not really. What happened was um, our our biggest risk at the time and our mark to market risk at the time was the loss in credit we extended to, to David Askin. Right. And, and I can go into some detail about what happened at Kidder, but you know, toward the end of the year, Kidder really was committed and did sell, um, did sell it basically to Payne Weber. And I had to pare down my position and the derivative position, which was really you know, the heart of the risk, but also the heart of the return, um, I tried to buy uh, when we when I switched over to starting a hedge fund, and I would I uh, Bear Stearns actually bought it a little bit higher. It was li within a percent of you know where I had it marked, but it was really under it was really undervalued security. So I got a booby prize of this uh, non agency derivatives, and that's how we started um, the hedge fund. Before Michael started Ellington. He cut his teeth working for more than 10 years at Kidder Peabody. He was fortunate as this allowed him to take part in the explosion of the CMO or collateralized mortgage obligation market and mortgage derivatives. Because of this, Michael developed his own niche. 
This is not only what allowed him to go out on his own, as he will discuss in the next section, but it also enabled him to find other opportunities that those focused on more mature markets might have missed. Fortuitous timing like this, coupled with hard work and talent, is a common hallmark shared with many of the greatest investors. You'll notice that Michael had an incredible tenure at Kidder Peabody, and he was named in 1991 as the firm's man of the year. But much of the discussion is focused on the bond bear market of 1994 and the lessons he learned from the early crisis in his career. This is another trend you will notice in the interview. Crisis events had large impacts on Michael, and in each case, he took away lessons, he seized opportunity, and he adapted. And in this case, it led to his founding of Ellington. So you started a hedge fund, so this is what, 95 now? Yes, the, the, we formed the partnership on the last days of 94, and we were, I guess, in business, so to speak, in really January of 95. So, so you start Ellington, what's the idea? What's the idea in your head that you want to do with a hedge fund? Because, you know, you're starting from scratch. There's right. not that many people in this game still at this point. You're pretty That's early. Correct. Yeah. So I didn't have, um, you know, I, I consider myself someone who could generate alpha and really understood the securities. I was not sophisticated whatsoever about what a hedge fund was or how to start one or anything like that. So my visions were somewhat limited to what I knew at the time. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a mentor and a really patient uh, um, sponsor at the, the Ziff brothers. Um, and what happened was it was around the time, like I said, like in 94, there was this blood on the streets, if you will. And a classmate of mine by the name of Dan Stern, who you know is at, he runs Reservoir Capital, it's a private, private equity firm, had said to me, yeah, you know, you should think about starting a hedge fund instead of going to Payne Weber. And so I said, well, you know, I vaguely knew what a hedge fund was. I didn't know what a LLC was or anything like that. So he explained the whole thing to me and even said to me, what's the name of that, that town you're from? And I said, Ellington. And he, said, so and he goes, that's it. So he was responsible. <laughs> <laughs> he was responsible for a lot of that, you know, uh, getting me going in the beginning. And um, I had just gotten married a few years before. And my firstborn, my son, my oldest son, was born in December of 93. I was not a city person by any means. And uh, my wife at the time, you know, she was from a small town in Europe. We wanted to move out of, of the city. And then with the, with our son, you know, coming and all that, it just made a lot of sense. And then to have the hedge fund, the ability to work in Connecticut just made a lot of sense. So it wasn't purely an economic thing. It was, there were a lot of factors that went into deciding to starting the hedge fund. So anyway, so then like I said, the Ziff brothers were the original LP and they were a partial GP owner as well. And they had this sort of tried and true model of starting these hedge funds because they had done it with Starwood. They had done it with Oxyf and a few others. Um, and then there you go, we were off to the races. I put in a decent amount of my personal capital, Ziff put in money and we started a, uh, well at the time it was just a domestic mortgage backed derivative hedge fund uh, seeded with some of the bonds that I had that I was able to buy from Kidder Peabody. And then everything else was just purchased in the open market. At a time, it was still a very, very good time to, uh, to buy. And, you know, I can't stress how unsophisticated I was about anything other than mortgages. So we, we got things good. We, you got the band together. Um, and they were, um, it's an interesting group of original partners that of the six original partners, five are still with us today, 26 wow. years later. Wow. Absolutely. So, um, you know, it was myself, this fellow Mike Zaretsky, um, uh, Ollie Kojo, who is uh, still a partner at Ellington, and he was the non-agency, um, uh, you know, PM. Larry Penn, who I met in 1979 at Harvard in MapQuest. Um, uh, John Genacopoulos, the James Tobin Professor of Economics at Yale, a very well-known economist, happens also to be my cousin. <laughs> and then another fellow who, who has since retired. So, um, but anyway, so 
we um, we 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 started out there and then grew um, our offerings to a, a, a you know a, a offshore fund and then you know from there grew from hundreds of millions to you know ten plus billion. Over so, yeah. So 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 now we're in the kind of mid nineties phase. Do you change your strategy? Um, over that period of time, are you starting to do more relative value trading? You know what what's doing as you're evolving, getting more capital. Right. You've had some good returns because I'm I, I, what I'm going to get to is 1998. Yeah, absolutely. To... So the answer is, by and large, not really. In in the sense that there's this been this persistent opportunity in structured mortgages for you know since then and even prior to then, as I had mentioned. So that was still the lion's share of the way in which we earned alpha. Um, and what I think is one of the sort of distinctive features of Ellington that I'll get into um, is our ability to analyze securities through modeling, using data to come up with models that will help us value um, these securities. So that basic tenet base was, you know, it's still with the state. It's how we made our money in the in the in the mid '90s to late '90s. Um, that said, we had some other strategies um, at the time, and one that didn't do very well. We had, but but by and large, it was still mostly mortgages. There are a number of lessons we learned in '98. I I can go through in some detail what happened in '98. Yeah, I think that would be useful, for people, because it's one of the most important lessons that everybody learned when they were around. Right. Um, 98. So I think it's really helpful for people to explain your process through that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, well, you know, what, what, what were the good things about 98 is that it obviously prepared us for 2008 and 2020. Um, so um, having good, mo when you have a really good or a pretty good, at least valuation model, you naturally have a good risk model as well, because now that is an easier order. To, you know, you're not, instead of precisely getting the price, you're getting the change in the price. It's actually easier to get. So we had very good, uh, I thought very good valuation models. Um, we still do. And so as a result of that had good risk models. Um, however, the risk models tell you in theory, what's gonna to happen to the prices when things move and things like that. But what actually happens isn't exactly that, as we all came to find out. And whether you have um, you have insufficient uh, funds to cover a margin call, or your repo's not structured right, or your lender just decides that they want to do something, and this is because of the contagion of this gigantic overlevered hedge fund blowing up, right? Yeah, has it ramifications is. to yeah. everybody. Yeah, I think it's which fair. is long-term I mean, capital management for people. Yeah, who but to tell it as a story, you're right. I think um, what occurred, if if you recall, was around. I think it was at the end of July, they sent out a, a newsletter saying they were down about fifty percent, which struck me as very odd. I mean may be true, but like that you're either at 50%, you're either going to come back or you're going to go to zero. It's not a stable equilibrium point. It was kind of scary. And they had, um, obviously they're funding a lot. From were you aware of this happening or was this a shock to, you kind of obviously knew that they were having some losses, but was this no, a, was shock a shock? To yeah, it was a shock. Wow. Okay. It was a shock. Um, they were very, you know, they were very private in terms of how they ran their business and things like that. And so, um, but how it affected us was, I, you know, had less to do with mortgages per se and more to do with what you're referring to as the leverage in the system that had to, the, had to go through basically Solomon Brothers at the time, who were looking to merge with Citigroup. And um, I had done everything possible to be careful about these things. So I had staggered my repo and gone out three months, but I was still somewhat subject to the vagaries of what they would consider the value and the margin call and things like that. So as a result of that, what I thought were very, very overly aggressive margin calls, I had to get my position down. So it was, you know, instead of fighting about like, you know, <laughs> what, you know, what, what's right at the time, you have to act. 
And so we actually acted um, during a time when the market was closed the day before Columbus Day. And I called up all the PMs. I know we literally had a series of three auctions going into that Monday to pare our positions down. And, um, and we had to take a loss. You, you know, I think our portfolios were down close to 20% or something like that. Um, it was this would a, have been your largest monthly drawdown by yeah, a massive Yeah, it was a magnitude. big, big, big drawdown. It was an unmitigated disaster, to be honest with you. And I felt, you know, I, I felt it wasn't quote unquote fair in some ways, but it doesn't matter. You know, you learn your lesson. And um, I won't go into the details of what happened after that with that. But like, the point is, better not to get into that situation. Um, and so we, we changed our firm a lot after that. And one thing that we did, it was a very simple thing, is we repudiated prime brokership and we decided we'd be our own prime brokers. So hmm. what we did was we put out our securities um, to, to borrow against to different lenders and we put up our haircut and we kept our cash at Bank of New York. What the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems we had was not so much whether we had too much leverage per se, but the fact that we were leveraging with our prime broker who determined how much cash could go out. So you never want to be in that situation. No, because your leverage is, is their discretion. You don't want to borrow from your prime in these very illiquid fixed income markets. I know it happens in equities and I'm not saying anything about that, but this is like something one that needs to be very careful about. And it requires a, a, a tremendous amount of infrastructure within your firm to do that because it's quite yeah, easy to just huge. call up your prime, but then you're sort of, you're at risk with the prime. So that's one thing. The other thing is it became apparent right away that the business is more than um, sort of like maximizing sharp ratio, if you will. And it's about maximizing returns, but not taking big left tail risk. And the two things are entirely different because of the amount of negative convexity in our market, both inherent to the securities and also in the system itself. I mean, obviously you can see there's massive left tail risk in almost all markets for, for, for that, for this kind of phenomenon. So, um, so- Because it's I, essentially, it, it acts like a short vol strategy. It so, does act like a short fall strategy. And I'm going to get into some details about what happened in 2020, because not only does it does it act like a short fall strategy, but in order to get returns, a lot of managers who hadn't gone through a big crisis actually implicitly or explicitly sold credit options uh, on top of what was already a left tail risky portfolio. And um that was spurred on by allocators looking to put money to work and chasing returns. And it's just the same thing you see in all markets. It happened in the hedge fund market in 2020. Um, anyway, so um, I can get on my soapbox about that later. But the point is that this is like when you're hit with something like this, it's, it's, um, it's something that you need to really attend to and you don't forget about it. And so... Um, the idea of not just calculating what the theoretical risk of security is, but to do these war scenarios um, where, you know, the client might have liquidity, um, the, the lender might have liquidity if you're coming up on repo. So you're basically not using just bar models. You're now right. building in a whole bunch of other... Other things. You're looking at cash flow timeline and saying, you know, can this cash be taken away from me for these reasons? And, 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 and that's managing left tail. So, you, you know, there's a lot of, you, you can say what would happen to your securities if the high yield market were to go down 20% or the stock market were to go down 30 or something, but that the knock-on effect of that needs to be calculated as well. And it's much larger, I think, than what people, you know. Hmm, fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, so that's a big part of, you know, still what we do today in risk management. Um, there's a hands-on part of it uh, that's, you know, it's, it's not as theoretical as you might think, but it requires just meticulous keeping track of, at, you know, where your cash would be and things like that. Now, there is so much to unpack in this section, but perhaps most important, though, are the lessons Michael learned 
from the LTCM crisis in 1998. As shockwaves from the collapse of LTCM went through the market, Michael had to take his first dose of medicine. And not because the securities he owned were inherently worthless, but because his prime broker was making a margin call. Now, he even says that he thought the margin call was aggressive, but he had no recourse and he was forced to liquidate positions in a weekend auction that resulted in substantial, but luckily manageable losses. Remember, markets are a complex organism, and even if you technically have no direct exposure to a shock, it's difficult to escape the falling dominoes when your counterparties, their clients, and their clients' clients have exposure. The big lesson for Michael was that if you wanted to operate in these illiquid markets, where he had edge and expertise, then he needed to drastically change the structure of his firm. He no longer wanted an external prime broker who could pull the rug out from under them at any moment. This required major changes to his firm, but was necessary to ensure that he wouldn't have to endure a forced liquidation like he did again. He highlights that he isn't saying everyone needs to do this, but for the illiquid and negatively convex types of securities, it could result in an existential event. It's really important to have this self-awareness about one, where is his alpha coming from? And then two, what special risks are inherent in that strategy and the difficult but necessary adaptations required to manage those risks? So let's wind forward to 2008. So now we've got a credit cycle, which is, you know, the leverage cycle, you know, the long-term capital times yeah. 100. Right. How did you get through that? So 2008 was, um, was an interesting year. Um, we were not over levered or anything like that. We, we, did, we did pretty well. You know, we, we had the proper protection on and, 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 and did okay. Um, and having your own prime broking operation meant that you didn't get everything pulled on you. I didn't get anything. No, and everybody like else that. did, right? I mean, everybody got killed by their PBs over that period. They did. And what's interesting now is I believe that, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but some non-negligible percent of hedge funds uh, that you might see on HSBC or something like that were formed even after 2008. So not everyone even had the, let alone the experience of 98, but many managers didn't have the experience of 2008. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's a rich history of people blowing up. <laughs> so, and, and so how does it change for you? Because by this stage, you're starting to run a really significant amount of money. How does that change your trading style and your risk management when you start you know, attracting a lot of capital because you navigated the crisis well. You know, yeah. you guys have got a great reputation, you've been going a long time. So you start attracting quite significant capital flows, I guess. We do, we do. And it's a diverse set of capital uh, types in the sense that instead of just looking at the amount of capital you have, I think I sort of think most of the capital by, not by fees or anything like that, but more by duration. And whether you're giving the client monthly, quarterly, 25% quarterly, annually, or if it's private debt for five years, that determines more about how you structure your portfolio than anything else. And understanding that- That's, you know, hard. Maybe, That's hard, Mike. It's very difficult. That's another variable to add into portfolio construction it's is managing your most, client duration. It, Next to actually choosing the, the assets, it's the second most important thing. Maybe the most oh, important thing. That's hard. Yeah, so, um, you know, I do mention, I try to put my hand up and get on my soapbox about hedge funds a little bit because... Um, let's, let's go there. Well, I do want to talk about it because maybe in, in my next life, if I'm not like a rock star, maybe I'll be a private equity manager. But like when you're, when you're a hedge fund, right, you're, you're still giving the client a put. Generally, these these lockups aren't big enough that you're you know you're allowing you're giving them some degree of liquidity even when there's a crisis, and they will can and will redeem because their clients might, for example, and then they might get a, a private equity call on the other end, 
So private equity has a call. They're long a call and we're sort of short a put. And, mm -hmm. um, there, you know, you can actually. Well, that was very typical in 2008. All the right. private equity were calling. Everybody's getting redeemed in the, in the hedge yes. fund world. You can run a lot of different toy models to tell you what the difference should be, you know, in terms of return. You put a lot of assumptions into it, but it's a big disadvantage for a hedge fund. So, um, but I, what is that? The Godfather one or two said, this is the business we chose. So that's it. So, um, but there's a lot of things that one needs to do about that to make an intellectually honest offering to a client, knowing that this could happen. And it's about managing left tail risk again and managing it in a way that, you know, should they want to redeem and should the haircuts double and all these other things happen, that you have enough cash to at least weather the storm and maybe even to buy. But that's expensive because that cash isn't always working, you know, at the highest rate of return. So that's where in 98, I, I mean, in 2008, I, <laughs> In 2020, we did well. Um, and yet yeah, to some degree in 2008, but in 2020, we were able to add positions in most of our you know, semi-liquid funds and didn't have to sell in any. One, we were sort of like- did it And work. was that because you anticipated the event or your portfolio was constructed in a way that gave you that opportunity regardless of what happened? It was just more the latter. Really? Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, look, everyone felt like the market was overwrought and all that. Um, but we're not paid to take these macro bets. And, you know, I don't want to like have a portfolio that like, takes a lot of tail risk because nothing's on the horizon. And then, you know, then takes all this tail insurance because we think something's going to happen. And everyone's talking about how they, you know, saw 2008 and saw 2020. And there's just, there's a lot of selective memory out there. I just don't, I just don't get involved. Well, and, and there's a, there's two different types of funds. I've explained to many people is a lot of the macro guys, and I came from that world, our job was finding those events, exactly. right? Yeah. We made all the return in 15 months and then did nothing. Sure. Guys like you would make all the money in the other times. Right. And then in the macro events, depending how the portfolios were constructed, yes. they either got out flat or they lost a shit ton of money. Exactly. And was, That's exactly the point. Two different yeah. ways of running a business. It's exactly true. And, you know, I guess I'm good enough to know what I don't know. And I wouldn't want to be in that milieu where I'm trying to like, you know, call these major events. It's not, not what the clients are asking of me anyway. So the best thing to do is to have this sort of insurance in place and work around it and get the best returns you can. Now, does that, putting that insurance in place, how do you do that and not lower your returns significantly? Well, you do lower your returns, but not necessarily significantly. Um, and, you know, there's, well, you know, some of it's, some of it's little trade secrets and things like that, but you know, you, there are lots of, you, you do have some advantage in the fact that um, correlations tend to go up a lot in tail events. So you can avail yourselves of uh, oneself of a lot of different kinds of- So you can look for cheaper hedges that are uncorrelated in normal times that become Everything goes to a delta of one at yeah. the same time, correlation of yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't buy, you know, S and P puts exclusively to hedge my fixed income position or anything. But like, there, you know, there were lots of things. You know, there, there are some trades that where, um, you know, the liquidity event, a liquidity event change, like a basis trade or something like that, could work in your advantage. Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of these. There's lots. And those of can be pretty cheap hedges because they, they don't be. do anything. Absolutely. Yeah. The way Michael thinks about clients based on duration of capital and how that affects your strategy is key to understanding one of the shortcomings of the hedge fund model. It's also one of the major advantages that individual investors have. Michael understands that his clients can and will pull their money out in times of stress. And this, like aggressive margin call discussed earlier, can lead to forced liquidation, which again, in his relatively illiquid assets, can be devastating. He compares this with private equity, who in times of crisis can do a capital call, where they can actually force their clients to give them more money than they previously promised.
Individual investors are lucky in this sense as they have no clients but themselves other than personal events which might require them to dip into an investment fund before they had planned. And this allows investors to take longer term horizons than hedge funds who may be worried about clients pulling capital at the end of the month or the quarter. In addition to this great insight about client duration versus investment time horizon, Michael also drops a gem about hedging and how in the real left tail events, correlations go to one. What he's saying here is that oftentimes you can find a cheaper hedge than on its face doesn't seem to hedge your exposure, but in the real left tail events where you need hedging the most, will do just fine as everything is sold off together. Now this allows you to carry hedges with minimum drag on your portfolio in the good times and to be well prepared for moments like March of 2020. You know, um, when the market gets overbought, you know, there may be callable securities are rich and they could they have some, you're really looking for some downside convexity. Um, and, uh, you know, the point is that leading up to 2020, it was actually the opposite thing happened. Allocators had gone into, um, into our space, which is the structured credit space, which I thought there was a high bar there in terms of like what returns one needed to attract money because, you know, after 2008, everyone was making money, uh, yet people are wary of the, it's a rather abstruse area, right? People don't understand structured credit that much. So the- No, and everyone's money. terrified after 2008 of structured credit, right? Because nobody understands it. Right. And so what happened is we had put up good numbers. A lot of our competitors had put up good numbers. And finally, people started, you know, allocators started to say, we've got to get invested. But, you know, then, you know, you know, spreads as spreads tightened. I think, like I said before, some of our competitors had either wittingly or unwittingly gone the other way and had taken actually had too much tail risk as opposed to hedging it. Um, there's a lot of things going on in bespoke corporates, for example. Uh, there's lots of ways to implicitly, um, you know, take on tail risk in, in, in the, our markets, which have natural negative credit convexity. So um, anyway, so that that conspired, I think, against um, the, the space. And, you know, the watershed event was March 23rd when some of the REITs started to fail and they had a sell. And keep in mind, and I'm gonna get into this later because you know that is an area of opportunity that we invest in, but a, a REIT portfolio is just a levered structured credit or bond portfolio. And so it's run many times a lot of these REITs like a hedge fund. So the margin calls came in that way. Um, it wasn't just through you know, head, you know, private hedge funds. And um, you go back and look at the price action of REITs, it was, you know, it was disastrous at the time. So, um, so yeah, that was that was another structured credit event, without a doubt. But it was coupled with many other, you know, the equity markets and everything else. So, how do you look going forwards? Because we've we've now gone through this cycle, which is an extraordinary cycle, right? We had the biggest recession of all time globally. The credit markets blew up for short term, right? And then the Fed came in and quashed everything yeah absolutely and spreads have collapsed and it feels like there's no risk ever again in these markets how, how do you navigate this whole uh, the rapid change and then going forwards i mean where do you find opportunity in this right yeah well so, you know you're asking the you're asking you know the the you know the fifty thousand dollar question or whatever the million dollar question so um so you know like in 2020 we put we bought $10 billion worth of credit securities. And I mean, we not only did we not have to sell, but clients actually came in. We begged them, you know. Uh, this is a huge in. opportunity. We need, they yeah. came in, you know, so we put all this money to work and now we find ourselves in a situation that you're describing to some degree. Um, so the major dislocations without a doubt are gone. And, and that's true. But there are many structured credit opportunities because keep in mind, this is a very idiosyncratic market. Um, let me just give you a little background on how the market trades and what it is. Yeah, please. And then from that, you might be able to infer that on a bond by bond basis, there's opportunities because this is 
a trillion plus dollar market that trades over the counter only. There's no central exchange. And every security is different from the next, whether, you know, a, a tranche of a CLO or a CMBS or a residential mortgage backed security, CMO or anything like, you know, or loans. Um, so each one is different. Each one needs to get traded by appointment, if you will. I mean, you know, there's some efficiencies in the market until over a Bloomberg chat or this or that, but it's not like trading stocks. And it's a real roll up your sleeves kind of valuation because you've got this tranche that's in this deal that's backed by all these, you know, loans, if you will. And then you've got to run the cash flows to a cash flow engine and run different scenarios and weight the scenarios and then put a, a discount rate on each one and then come up with a value. And you've, you know, we're doing that thousands of times a day for all these different securities. So of course it's not an efficient market. And you know, things can be off by hundreds of basis points, even in the background that you're describing. Even with the competition of, you know, you guys, Fortress, Canyon, there's some big pools of capital in your space. There Does is, it... however, not as big as it was. Huh. You know, and some of the names you mentioned do this. It's not their primary business, but others where it was their primary business, they've been hampered quite a bit. And like I said. It's a very big market. It's a trillion dollar plus market. And, um, you know, so it's just a question of where the equilibrium point is. And it's moved a bit where, you know, there's not as many dollars chasing um, as before the crisis because there have been some notable, um, you know, problems and, and some that aren't even known. But, you know, some of our competitors are silently frozen or like still working through redemptions. And so it's it's not, you know, it's an issue, you know, it's an issue on the leverage side. Now, you know, there's other players, right? There's, you know, other institutions that buy, long only players buy, um, insurance companies buy directly and things like that. But, you know, there are a lot of these orphan types of securities lower down the capital structure, less liquid um, and other characteristics of them that really are to fall into the hedge fund manager's purview. And, and like I said, you know, there's plenty of buyers, but there's a lot of there's also just a lot of opportunity. Um, so there's an inefficiency that's just basically in structured credit that will always persist. Um, and there, you know, there's a little bit of a premium on that inefficiency right now. And so we are finding pockets of opportunity um, you know, in, in all the structured credit markets. And I can go into a little bit of detail on each one if you'd like, but, um, but I just, you know, it is important to, to just note that this is like, it's still a very sort of closed private market, even though it's a big market. And so how far out on the risk curve are you right now for the cycle? Because it's it's kind of, it's a relatively new cycle now. We had the blow right. up. We're now on the cleanup phase. You said some of your competitors are still impaired. So there's opportunities around. Are you kind of in the bulk of the risk curve or are you starting to move out? And what, what does that mean? Where, where are your investments lying right now or your focus? So, um, so it depends on which part of the structured credit market we're talking about. Um, in the mortgage market, the structured credit, the biggest part, the uh, non-agency legacy securities are very well covered in the sense that these securities are backed by loans that have very low loan to value. And it's the likelihood of appreciable losses on these securities is very low. And as you'd expect, so are the returns. You know, this is a LIBOR plus 300 market, if you will. Right. That finances, eh, okay. So you have to get a little bit of leverage to make the sort of hedge fund returns you want to make. Um, so you can do some of that, but that you wouldn't want to do all of that. The good thing about that market is that's a market that we are, you know, extremely active in. We hold a large portfolio of these securities. Um, the dealers come to us sometimes for liquidity and we trade that market a lot and uh, we're able to um, augment returns through trading. Right. And that, and you know, that's a distinctive feature of Ellington. We have a lot of, you know, our DNA is from Wall Street. So, you know, it's one thing to project a sort of like after levered return and after hedge return. And I didn't talk about hedging the tail risk on that yet, which 
is not, it's not the tail risk there isn't quite as great as other securities, but like that's a cost as well. Um, so, but anyway, so in that market, I would consider the credit risk of that market relatively benign compared to the credit risk of other structured credit markets. Like if you look at CMBS, for example, um, CMBS is, uh, is, is a market that we're very much involved in. And we have an eye toward distressed situations and events, but um, we're not making a macro bet in any large way there. Um, one interesting thing about that market is the indexes, the indices, um, the CMBS called CMBX indices, track the cash very closely. So it's a market where you can very tightly hedge. So if you ask me, you know, like if we said, oh, I bought a single B or a double B in CMBS, you'd say, well, why are you bullish? You know, why? That's crazy. It might have like mall risk or something like that. But the point is that it would be more of a relative value play. Right. And, you know, I wanted to make a small case for relative value now because um, there is some question about the macro directions of a lot of markets. And if you look and see at hedge funds in particular, you know, it's, a, it's only been three or four months, but, you know, relative value hedge funds have done pretty well this year. I think they're toward the top. And I would expect that to continue if you want to, if this environment would continue. Um, so, the idea of pairing assets with hedges is probably a good one right now, especially if you're in these markets where there's a lack of efficiency and on a security by security basis, you can generate alpha that way. And that's something we've done for a long time. I want to get back a little bit to a couple of things you talked about. Um, one thing was the trading. So, so let's say you put a structural position on, you then trade around it, provide the street some liquidity, and you you incrementally increase some returns from doing that. Is yeah, that what you absolutely. mean? Absolutely, sure. You know um, the lines have, are blurred a bit between a street dealing desk and, and a hedge fund when it comes to you know trading securities because they're absolute large prop portfolios and large trading positions on the street are not the norm anymore as a result of regulation. So, you know, someone has to sop up that liquidity risk and sometimes, you know, hedge funds will do it. And, you know, we've tended to be able to do that to some degree, especially in the mortgage market, um, mostly in the legacy, you know, structured mortgage market. Not so much we're gonna take down billions of dollars of pass-throughs or something like that, but through our public companies, we do some large pass-through trades, although there are many much larger than us. And it helps that you've come from this background. I mean, your background was the, the kind of making markets and trading from kid of Peabody. So it's part it was, of your DNA. Yeah. And my, some of my partners uh, that are on the desk have the same background. You know, this fellow Mark Tukotsky, who's co-CIO with me in the public company, has a very long, you know, and storied trading background. He worked at Kidder Peabody and CS and all that. So, and, you know, he's instructing the other PMs to do the same so it's, it's definitely in our DNA and it, it does add to alpha. Um, it's nothing that you, you can definitely, you, you know, it's hard to know exactly what that, you know, how much more you're going to, how much more juice you'll get from the lemon on that. Yeah. But, it, but it tends to happen, you know, it just tends to happen. Um, and so, also, oh, I, yeah, sorry. And also I want to go, you mentioned about hedging the tail again, which is a very, you know, thing that really defines what you do in part of your strategy. And how are you thinking about tail hedging now? Well, the same way, you know, the same way that... Um, so you're looking for well, cheap volatility and assets. Yeah, you can choose scenarios. Um, you know, if you're credit sensitive, one scenario that's, a, that's not a bad one to look at that tends to sort of resonate through all the markets uh, would be a high yield down scenario, like um, high yield down 20, I would consider a tail risk. Um, yeah. High yield down 20 occurred basically in, in March, right? Yeah. So like we were 109, 110, we went to 87, 88 or something like that. That's 20%. Right? Yeah, I made some good money just by HYG puts. You know, that was a great trade yeah. for a while. HYG puts sometimes are, are a great tail hedge, by the way. They're cheap, yeah. They, you know, they have been at times, even recently, we've done some of that. Um, so that's very astute on your part. Uh, but <laughs> I've been around a while. 
So, but you know, you need to sort of measure, given what your assets are, what your drawdown is, given those scenarios. And one thing that I think we did extremely well, and I just, I really want to, uh, uh, I want to say that our research staff did a fantastic job, was predicting about, but pretty accurately, where prices of structured, all these different structured products would end up had high yield gone down 20 points, which it did. Mm. And it was much to the surprise of even the PMs how accurate, because no one really knew because it hadn't happened, right? You had the 2015-16 you, you scenario, that was all you had. So, um, so that was good. And it left us in a situation that we thought we would probably be in, and then Which is started, pretty rare. Let's face it. Your hedges never really work how you want them to when you need them to. Right. And, and so, but if you know what's going to happen or you think, you know, when you measure it accurately, then it's sort of on, on you if you don't take care of it. Right. So, um, so that worked out well. And as I said, you know, we didn't have to sell in any of our funds. A few, we had dry powder and it was, and then mostly the clients knowing that we were credible, you know, going through this and, and adding at the time, really made all the difference for us. Um, and so that exercise that you go through, uh, this down 20 for is, is one, it's one scenario, there's others, there's 2008 financial crisis, but these, those exercises you're going through continually, you know, every week and you're upgrading and changing and making sure that you're somewhat protected. Here, Michael discusses a few of the aspects of the market structure that allowed Ellington to generate alpha. See, they are invested in idiosyncratic, over-the-counter markets with large amounts of inefficiency. In general, an inefficient market or deep understanding of the dynamics leading to mispricing are where alpha is to be had. In Ellington's case, the combination of an expertise in analyzing individual securities their own unique structure as their own prime broker, and the low level of competition make operating in these markets worthwhile. As well, post-2008, the death of the Wall Street prop desk created new opportunities for Ellington to generate alpha by serving as a market maker and liquidity provider. For regular investors, inefficiency can be found and exploited in newer markets, smaller markets, Markets requiring specific knowledge that most investing generalists don't have. You should always be asking yourself what edge you have over other participants. You're more likely to have an edge in a market like illiquid microcaps or emerging sectors not covered by the most major firms than, say, trading the most popular large cap tech names. Talk me through REITs a little bit, because REITs is not a market I'm massively familiar with, and you obviously know it, and you said there's some nuance in the REITs market. How, yeah, how sure, we... sure. So I, yeah, I want to talk about two more things for sure, because um, I, I didn't get to CLOs, which is the other part of the structured credit. Yeah, that would be interesting so, as well. So that's one thing. I want to talk about financial equities, of which REITs are a large portion. And then I want to talk about loans and securitizations. So those are the three areas I'd like to finish up on it. If, if Love to. That's... And I don't care what order, but how about REITs? Because you asked. Okay. Um, so we trade financial equities and we believe our edge in financial equities is that we can understand and value the book, the underlying book of, the, of these financial equities pretty well. Um, it's, it's something that, I mean, I would shudder at trying to, you know, determine book value for some complicated bank or something like that. I don't, you know, but when it comes to like a REIT where they're buying liquid and somewhat illiquid structured credit, they're levering it, they post their REIT. Uh, that's, that's your bread and butter business. That's our group. bread and butter. And so, and when it comes to some of the more liquid REITs that do agency trading, we calculate their book second by second. So, um, so we know price to book very accurately on a lot of REITs. We also know or feel we know we can predict sometimes what the earnings are going to be better than others. Hmm. We know what the prepayment risk is because we buy a tremendous amount of alternative data. We spend millions of dollars on alternative data. And some of that has to do with, you know, the timing of when prepays will occur and things like that. So we use all that 
to try to value external portfolios. And REITs are just basically levered portfolios of mortgage-backed securities, if you will, and loans and things like that. That's a lot of what REITs are. And then there's other REITs that have mixed in with them some operating businesses, but even those you can value. And those operating businesses sometimes are businesses that administer and own master servicing rights or origination of, of different kinds of loans. Our public company has ownership and partial ownership on a few originators, a reverse originator, a non-qualified mortgage originator, which I'll talk about. And so that's all in the mix of the valuation of the company. But anyway, so I think we do a pretty good job there. And so as a result of that, we're comfortable trading those assets. And that comprises a lot of the uh, financial equity uh, world that we're, that we're trading in. And, you know, these price to books are very, very volatile. They can, you know, they can go to in, from the 60s to 100. So, you know, um, uh, so anyway, so there's a lot, we've found a lot of, you know, opportunities there because these are, like I said, they're levered portfolio, fixed income portfolios, but they trade like stocks. You know, the, if the stock market goes up or down, they'll go up or down for no reason other than that, for example. Uh, and that gives you, you know, an opportunity, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's even opportunity in the uh, contingent claims, like the, the options market on a lot of these as well. So, okay, so that's one thing. Um, the other, the third leg to the stool of structured credit, like I try to think of structured credit by obligor or something like, you know, you think about mortgages and you think about, you know, residential mortgages, commercial mortgages, and then corporates. And on the corporate side, um, you know, the structured credit would, you know, what's looming large in structured credit would be CLOs. And there are still compelling opportunities in CLOs and they've come up quite a bit. You know, they've obviously rallied back quite a bit, but uh, a lot of the vanilla paper by the top tier issuers and things have, but um, anything that requires a lot of loan level analysis and structural analysis still, there's opportunity there. And so we're very- What kind of complexity goes into some of these then, into the non-plain vanilla stuff? Well, you know, there are these mezzanine tranches that have to pass certain tests that could shut them off. And then there's certain, you know, uh, underlying collateral characteristics that change that can determine the timing of that. Um, there's optionality, you know, some, some of the, um, some of the collateral bear, might barely cover one of the tranches. So, you know, there's some optionality in the tranche and whether it will get. Uh, so how do you price this? Do you build models with the optionality built in? Yeah, so it's just much in the same way you do it for a mortgage. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a simple, it's not a simple exercise. No, and clearly. again, it's, a, it's an over the counter market, you know, and there are other players in the market, other hedge funds, some of whom you mentioned and things like that, but like, what, it's a big market. There's a lot going on there still. Um, the last area I wanted to talk about is, are, are the, is the loan market. Because the loan market, that's the fodder that backs a lot of these securitizations. And to the extent you can disintermediate and own an originator or buy loans directly and securitize, um, that's another source of alpha. And we do that in many areas, but primarily in our public company, we, in one of our public companies, we do that where we own, like I, I had mentioned, um, partial stakes or majority stakes in a couple originators. So for example, um, the non-qualified mortgage space is very interesting, a very interesting market. And those that don't fit the Fannie, Freddie, Ginny bucket for, you know, they might be self-employed or things like that, only have bank statement, not a W-2. Um, that market is humming along. And if you look, though, this is an interesting statistic. I, I think it'll blow your mind, actually. Our last securitization that we did, was, I don't know, let's say like 300 million or something like that, 250 to 300 million, of non-QM was in mid-February, the note rate on the loans was about 575. And our cost was in the 103s or something like that. And you know, we, you know, you have a prepayment assumption about it and a loss assumption that gives you some yield. We sold 99 and a half percent of the bonds that backed that. So basically almost the whole deal at a 1.09 yield. You know, the senior AAA was 90% or something, you know, was like traded below 1%. Wow. So it's an incredible opportunity, right? 
Yeah. You know, we're left with a residual piece, uh, obviously, that bears the prepayment and credit risk, but we're starting, you know, the 100 meter dash on the 75 meter line <laughs> with, with a securitization like that. It's just, it's a stark example of what, what you can do if you, you know, go through the process of going from loan to securitization, like in this particular case in the mortgage market. So I thought you'd find that interesting. And do you, do you get a look at just kind of private sector loans? Because, you know, the banks are out of that game in some respects, you know, uh, everything from trade finance to other types of loans. Do you look at that stuff or is it you really? Absolutely. So, you know, we have flow agreements on consumer loans. We do reverse reverse mortgages, which is a very exciting space. And I think it's been, it's, it's growing space and it makes sense a lot, I think. It makes so this is baby boomers cashing out of their houses. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And there was a little stigma associated with it at one time, but like, I think it's just, it should be- It makes total the, sense, right? It should be a, a, you know, part of the, one of the legs of the stool for retirement almost. I think, you know, with all this equities caught up in these homes. Um, and so so we do some of that. Um, we do a little bit on the, on the non-prime, in subprime um and this, this, this kind of basket of just at a very top level the basket of kind of private sector loans what kind of yields so are you seeing in that market or even spread and did it change how did it change over the last 12 months just fascinated in this well if you look at the consumer this is highly model dependent right but the good news is that we have the law of large numbers in our favor, which we do in a lot of these data sets, you know, because we have lots of loans and lots of history and things like that. So I say it with some degree of humility, but, you know, I think that the models, I'm going to give you what an after our guess, modeled guess loss is for yield. And on the, on the consumer side, it's still LIBOR plus 600 or something like that. Wow. Wow. But, you know, you're, you know, you're really, you know, maybe almost at least that, but I just can't stress to you how dirty, dirty your hands get when you're dealing, you know, you're. No. You're yeah. Buying. And it's, it's expensive for you to do because there's a it's huge amount of work. You're accumulating, you know, these are very small loans. And there's a lot that goes into securitizing and, and leveraging and, you know, prior to securitization. So, but that's the, that's the answer. That number has, you know, sort of ratcheted down over time, but, um, um, it's a hard way to, it's making that money the hard way. Um, yeah, it sounds like it's juicy, but it's actually expensive right. costly. You know, it's, it's a it's, costly it's hard business. To do. It's not accessible to a, to a retail investor, or even to a lot of institutional investors. Um, you know, on the non-QM mortgage side, um, you know, let's say that you've got a three-ish, probably spread duration, you're, you're probably 300, you know, you're still, you're still in the, you know, LIBOR plus 300 at least easily, you know, gross spread pre-securization. Um, and then you saw the results of the securitization where you're, you know, you're basically security, securitizing at LIBOR plus 100 or you're taking out almost all your risk. So that's, that's more almost of a pseudo arbitrage than it is a cash and carry trade, if you will. Yeah. But, but the fodder again is like at least LIBOR plus three hundred. But you're buying, you know, credit risky loans, and so you're buying them in loan form. You're not buying them in QCIP form. The opportunities that Michael is looking at right now within financial equities like REITs, uh, structured credit like CLOs, and actually securitizing loans themselves again fit within the frameworks he has discussed before. He's looking for inefficiencies and he's looking for mispricings. With REITs, their fluctuations correlating with broader equity market moves provides opportunities to exploit these deviations from the value of the underlying asset. Ellington's securitization business is also very interesting as again, they're going into loans that don't fall within the normal window that other investors focus on, like non-qualified mortgages or reverse mortgages. Now, most investors won't be able to jump onto these types of activities to up their own alpha, but it is important 
to realize the larger array of opportunities afforded to firms of the size, status, and sophistication of a firm like Ellington. How do you, having been running Ellington for 26 years, how do you still get the excitement to do this? Because not, it, you know, it's a hard really business. The, the hedge fund industry is not an easy game. It takes right. a lot out of you. Yes, you've had a lot of success in it, but it's not easy. How do you keep the motivation to say, yeah, we're going to do this? Well, I personally enjoy working with my colleagues. As I had mentioned, these are friends and in some cases a relative that have been go back 30, 40 years with. And we hire very dynamic, intelligent, interesting young people. Um, and it's very stimulating. Um, I also want to do well. I want to you know, be successful for the client's sake. Um, it's not about earning the money per se, but everything around that. But I try to create a great work environment. I think people really enjoy working at Ellington. One thing about Ellington that's a little different than maybe some of these other, um, some other head, you know, every hedge fund has its own sort of ethos and sort of, you know, interest. So we don't, if I have a PM who has been with us for five or six or seven years and has made a lot of money and then he loses money or he or she loses money, we're not going to like cut, you know, fire the person or just take away all their capital. They didn't wake up stupid one day. I mean, you know, so, so we, you know, if there's value, we stick by the PM and we stick by the position. A, B, the, there are no, the pods, if you will, are real pods because everyone's sitting together. It's a highly collaborative environment where the PM has a desk analyst and a researcher next to them. And that quote unquote pod is near another pod that's very similar, like all the structured credit PMs might sit together. So it makes for a very collegial environment, um, which I think makes it a great place to work. Now, do you run the risk of the overall firm at a top-down level, or is it all by at pod level? How do you think about the the kind of overall portfolio structure? You know, are you more like you know the the um, the kind of Baliasnis or guys like those, or do you run it as you know a few of you, you two? co-CIOs kind see, of yeah. taking the main so I don't really know exactly how some of these other, you know, like, um, I guess like a, what it would be like Millennium or- Like Millennium is a great exactly example of the- yeah. So I, I don't really know exactly how they do it, but so, but it, it's top down and bottom up, if you will, in the sense that we need to generally allocate capital to areas where we think there's opportunity. And then um, that decision is made from top down, but with the input of the PMs and what they're seeing and things like that and what we're measuring. But then at that point, you know, the PMs are, are very, very highly, you know, experienced PMs with, you know, decades of experience in some cases, you know, we're not gonna tell them exactly what to buy or anything like that. So- um, but You like, might say, we want to allocate more money to CLOs. You might say that, yeah. And, and but it's not like, a, it's not, there's not a lot of tension because this is generally done by everyone talking about it. And, yeah. you know. Because those guys are sticking their hands up saying, hey, listen, we've got a great opportunity here. Yeah, right. And the other thing is, and the thing that you might have brushed on, I think you did, was be also that, you know, we the portfolio construction needs to include insurance and hedging and things like that. And that's also done, you know, at, at a top level with, with buy-in from the portfolio managers. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's fascinating because, you and Ellington, it's a very, you, you're in very complicated markets. You really know the details of what you do. You look at risk, not first order risk, but second and third order risk, yeah. which has proven over time to have done very well for you, it smoothed out the return profile. Um, and it's just, you know, I've just found this whole conversation fascinating of, of how you got here and then how you've thought about this, because it's not my world, the world that you're in. But the complexity of and how you managed to simplify it down to make it, you know, work over time has been, you know, phenomenal. It's, it's amazing. You've done it. Well, thank you. No, but I think it's true. You know, you have to, you do have to get punched in the face once in a while. And like 98 was like that. Um, and the market's also, you know, so this is an evolving thing. 
but also giving credit to allocators. Um, I don't get these phone calls every two weeks. How are you doing? And um, and they're not trying to you know maximize these monthly returns. And they understand that what this is is this is a longer term thing. And what you really want to do is maximize return subject to a drawdown risk, not try to beat you know an index by thirty basis points in any given month when you have this massive you know, underlying risk or something like that. Um, so the market's matured, the allocators have matured. I'd like to see more um, consultants being involved. I'd like to see more state pension funds being involved if they can, you know, um, I'd like to, to always trying to demystify the market. There are great opportunities, but by and large, the market's matured quite well and it's, you know, Look, every market's experienced left tail risk, but people tend to understand it more in other markets, so they're less afraid of it. But it occurs everywhere. It it, it does. Yeah. It's a, I mean, without risk, there is no reward. Exactly. It's you just have to understand the risks that you're running is all it is. Yeah, it's the obverse side of the coin. There's no doubt about it. Mike, look, amazing conversation. Thanks so much for your time. It was really, really interesting. I well, think. thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, I think people will have learned a lot. I think people are going to take a lot of notes trying to figure out all of the acronyms of the world that you live in as well. <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh, my God, my head's going to explode. But right. no, fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it. And thanks so much for doing this. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Bye. Rao really summed it up well there in the final moments of that interview. Michael and Ellington have real expertise in complex markets. And although there is always a risk, it's the true understanding of the unique features of that risk that allows them to be successful. Michael has evolved and grown a lot over his multi-decade career, often after times of crisis. And if there is one thing to highlight from this piece, it's the double-edged sword of illiquidity and inefficiency, and how it seems that Michael has built a firm that is doing everything it can to take advantage of the opportunity it provides while simultaneously putting the same amount of effort into limiting the risks. This was a true pros interview, and there were many terms and ideas that may require a bit more study to fully grasp. We recommend that everyone take the time to go through the detailed notes that accompany this interview, as many of the explanations I wish I could have made in the interview are fleshed out more fully there. Did you know that we publish detailed notes alongside every episode of the Investor Masterclass? These are so much more than a simple transcript. This supplementary written material will help you extract the key points from each masterclass video, link you directly to related interviews, add more layers to the conversation, show relevant charts, and point you to additional viewpoints, including recommendations from our guests about their favorite books, plus a whole host of other materials that will help you build your own investment framework. So please make sure you use the link to these detailed written notes. You'll find it in the description of each Investor Masterclass video. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.